The Declaration of Support for Sustainability of PSU starts with action number one, to infuse sustainability into all colleges, schools, and programs. And that includes the very young. A new charter school in Clackamas County aims to do exactly that. The Springwater Environmental Sciences School is more than teachers and students. It's a vibrant community of families and community partners as well. The program brings kids up close and personal to the world around them. Holly Fee takes us on a field trip to sustainability. Listen to the water, listen to the water rolling down the river. Listen to the water, listen to the water rolling down the river. We saw sunbirds by the Spring has sprung here at Springwater Environmental Science School. It's Oregon, it's raining, it's blowing, but the flowers are blooming. We are here with Deb O'Dell, the principal of Springwater Environmental Science School. It's nice to meet you. Hi, Holly. Thanks for being here. Yeah, we look forward to you showing us how Springwater is an environmental and sustainable school today. Well, let's get in on out of the rain and go inside. Okay, in. thanks. The students here understand sustainability through the context of our school's mission and vision. And that started uh, with the board in defining the word environmental. We defined environmental sciences as being set in the context of sustainability. Science is our background bone of our study, so we're often looking at environmental science issues. The students consider it from the aspect of, is the solution sustainable to both the environment and the community? Or how can we look at a solution that's sustainable to both of those things? So in a sense, just by the context we approach the idea of sustainability is an organizing concept for their studies of environmental sciences. So as I'm reading, you're going to look for beautiful, powerful words that we're going to create a word bank out of that when we put the words together, we can form a poem. Literacy, or reading or writing, is contextualized around their science. So they read and write around what they're learning about in the environmental sciences. The land ethic simply enlarges the boundaries of the community to include soils, water, plants, and animals, or collectively, the land. This sounds simple. Do we not already sing our love for and obligation to the land of the free and the home of the brave? Yes, but just what and whom do we love? Certainly not the animals of which we have already extinguished many of the largest and most beautiful species. A land ethic, of course, cannot prevent the alteration, management, and use of these resources. Literacy in many ways resembles a regular school uh, building's approach to literacy where they have uh, their guided reading or the different curriculum that they're going to be using. Kids are reading and writing and being taught in small groups and all the wonderful rich literacy practices you see with intervention practices as well. I love the environment and the animals. Together. 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 Thank you. <laughs> Um, when we get done with literacy, um, usually the daily schedule will take us to lunch. And the kids um, don't have a hot lunch program here. For, for us, immediately, this puts uh, a lot of emphasis on healthy lunches, for the good or the bad, being a parent myself who pack lunch. Um, we as parents have to take a step back and think about what we're putting in the kids' lunch. It puts, again, the question and the need um, in front of parents and families of what are we feeding our kids. Then also we have issues of packing. So we try to make it an effort to talk to parents about what they're bringing. For instance, today looking around the lunchroom, we need to talk about those plastic baggies which seem to have re-emerged in force. Lunchtime is a great way to say how do we, how do we practically act as a sustainable community from home to school. This is your lunch box? Yeah. Wow, that's great. When we started school, parents were kind of of the old school. We have a lot of hard habits to break in terms of how we take care of our earth and our world, and the kids will probably lead. So it's, as you know, when you turn, your ki turn kids on to an idea of reducing waste um, or turning off the water, um, amazingly they're after you at every step. So during lunchtime, the kids use a zero waste center to recycle 
and uh, compost. It's our green team that will be actually weighing the waste now and then eventually we hope to have each table group weighing their own waste so you can kind of embed a lot of fun activities. A few of the students stay and they help clean up on a rotating basis so that they take responsibility for our school. Again, when we founded the school, we felt it's important the kids understood that things weren't just done for them, that the that this is their place and that they have a role in sustaining or keeping it beautiful and clean and, and operational. So they'll stay and rinse off our dishes and get them ready to go into the sanitizer. And then, then our parent volunteers uh, finish up the rest of the uh, lunch pickup and fold our tables, put them away. Is every lunch day a parent volunteer day or are there any staff members that come in for lunch duty? We are relying mostly on parent help, and so we're lucky to have lots of families with parents who are able to come in and volunteer their time. Yeah, in terms of a sustainability concept, when you are relying on parents, uh, the sustainability issue goes both ways. You are more sustainable, in a sense, financially, because you are uh, re relying on parent volunteer to take that piece away from the, the budgetary constraints off of your regular programming. So more dollars can essentially flow to the kids and the learning. But what it does for us is as a community says, do we care enough about the education of our children around environmental sciences, around a small sustainable community to give to that? It's worth thinking about, do we have sustainable communities and small communities if we don't ask for them, if we don't expect for them to be if we don't put the responsibility for our children and their, and their welfare in the parents' hands. That in itself brings a certain amount of energy back to the system. Katie Schnur we're here with and she is the Springwater's only staff member. Everybody else is faculty. She does it all. She is the principal secretary. She takes care of lunch duty and many other things. Let's talk about the weather. It's a little windy today and I see that there's no actual covered play structure. What do the kids come out and do, rain or shine? They get to play in the sand pits. They like to create over in this area over here, there is a mud pit that they get to play in. So they take the water from another area where there's plenty of water and they take their buckets and they make their own dams, they make their own streams, they make their own rivers and they have a great time doing it. They love the mud, love the water. And before spring water was actually here in the charter school, this area looked quite a bit different, didn't it? Some of the items are actually from people's backyards that they don't want to use during the winter because their kids won't do it during the winter, but when they come to school, they love the items. Um, over here we have some tires from old tractors. Um, they would have been thrown away into the garbage instead. Instead they're here and the kids love to play in them and they have a great time. And the bridge, I know somebody told me that the bridge, the families actually constructed that bridge over the weekend. Yes, that was that was put in about one weekend's time, yeah. The founders of the school envisioned that the kids would literally just have more outside time, more green time, more time in nature, knowing the uh, largely um, uh, building off of uh, Lou's book, uh, Last Child in the Woods. and. They just knew that our kids needed to connect and find meaning through their natural curiosity in the outdoors. We're releasing a beetle. We okay. did a. We started with larva, oh, yeah. and our larva turned into a beetle. <laughs> and now that the larva has gone through the metamorphosis, it's time to release it. We need to have a discussion. Where do we want to put this beetle? Oh, if you have an idea. I Trevor? Reese. Sounds like we're going to the garden. Yes. 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 The integrated unit um, for both kindergartners and first graders and on up to our current seventh graders and next year eighth graders does embed their outdoor learning. Their outdoor learning happens on every other Friday roughly where we walk into the field strap on boots and whatever gear and we go down on the Friday afternoons or Friday mornings and that experience in the field is connected in either through finding data, finding questions, uh, finding examples in which to apply to their science learning in the class. Originally we thought that would take place on our five acres that we have our school building on. We did not know as we took um, over the site that there was 500 acres of metro land uh, available to us below that had just been uh, 
purchased through Metro Funds, and Metro said, yeah, take the kids down there uh, every other Friday. We have an agreement with them, and the kids go down on those fabulous field studies, which are in I, what I just call a multi-terrain type of uh, landscape where we can go through the fields, we can go into wooded areas, we can go along the stream beds and uh, look at wetlands and riparian areas. It's just a really amazing um, mini spheres uh, of study out there for the kids to apply to their various units. And it is a part of their integrated unit, so it's intentional learning that's connected back to the classroom that they read and write about. And you got a little yummy for my nearly empty tummy. Henny and Hedgy were ready. The Tom Tim reached for an egg and pulled out an acorn. At third grade, um, students will uh, do a natural resource unit where they look at um, how, how do we use natural resources? Where are they um, being depleted? Where are they being um, used in a sustainable way? For instance, the last unit we did resulted in the marimbas that we have on our stage. Where they watch that from the beginning, they watch the development or the creation of the marimbas from the actual milling of the wood to the end product and the playing of the instruments. Our goal from the very beginning of the school is that at the end of the time here, kids with us could pose sustainable community solutions to the community that would be accepted and uh, learn even the social skills involved in presenting such an idea to the kids. Well, Deb, I definitely want to thank you for taking us around your school, showing us everything, and it seems like your students here at Springwater are definitely learning tools to be sustainable. They sure are. Thank you for coming today and seeing our school and our kids. Great. And that's it, folks. I'm Holly Fee. Thank you.